Welcome to Faith and Freedom Fighters. I'm Robert Muse, co-founder and senior counsel of the American Freedom Law Center. And I'm joined by my fellow freedom fighter, co-founder and senior counsel, David Yerushami. As anyone listening to this show knows, social media, media giants, Facebook and Twitter, are run by left-wing progressives who are in the tank for the Democratic Party and its destructive anti-American agenda. If you are a pro-America conservative, or if you express a message that is counter to the democratic left-wing narrative on issues such as COVID-19, systemic racism, immigration, or the Second Amendment as just a few examples, then chances are you have been censored by the tyrannical social media censors, particularly if you have a large enough following. Well, we are going to do something about it. And so I'd like to welcome my colleague, again, David Yerushami. David, you're spearheading a federal lawsuit we're preparing to file in Arizona. And I'd ask you to uh, tell our audience about it, at least as much as you can, uh, understanding that, uh, you know, when we do uh, discuss our cases, that we are constrained by attorney-client privileges, and we don't necessarily want to give away litigation strategy. So, but with that in mind, uh, welcome, and the, the mic is yours. Thank you, Rob, and welcome to our audience. I'm going to drill down in phases, as it were, into this litigation, and keeping in mind what Robert said, until we file the lawsuit, um, the particular facts of the case that we'll be filing are going to be fall within the attorney-client privilege. Once the complaint is filed, the facts that are in the complaint, of course, become public. And the strategy that we have in mind in all areas, especially going forward, um, and we'll talk about how we strategize a bit, of course, falls under the attorney work product privilege, um, which akin to the attorney-client privilege, although it's not as exacting and as um, wide or as you know, broad as the attorney-client privilege, still is a privilege that we need to protect. And obviously, we don't want to give the bad guys in the government and in Twitter um, uh, the benefit of our legal thinking before they have to deal with it in court. So we all know, at least you should know, that the social media giants, Twitter and Facebook and others um, are censoring conservative speech. Now they will tell you that what they're doing is censoring false facts, or they will tell you they're censoring incitement speech meaning that kind of speech that's going to incite violence. And then they broaden it and say, um, they're going to censor hate speech. So you, we have three categories already, right? So we have false facts. We have speech that likely and imminently will lead to violence and intended to do so. And three, hate speech, just speech talking badly about some class of people, whether it's based upon race, religion, age, height, sex, what have you. To the extent that you understand those three, you understand that in the context, if Twitter and Facebook and so forth were the government, we talked about this at the prior, the prior podcast, that the First Amendment, free speech, only protects our speech is against the government. So the federal constitution specifically and originally protected us against the federal government censoring our speech. It was broadened after the Civil War to incorporate also um, the states in that process. And the states have their own constitutional and statutory law protecting speech. We're going to deal with the federal level right now. So the federal constitution protects our speech as against um, state action. Keep in mind that we're not allowed to just speak whatever we want. There are areas within First Amendment law that allows the government to control our speech when it's necessary and narrowly tailored when it falls within political speech, which is the most highly protected speech. 
And that includes political speech, includes public policy speech, includes speech about the matters of the day that people were talking about and concerned about, not just simply elections or politics, simply. So once you understand that the government is restricted, but is allowed to carve out areas. So for example, we mentioned these, there are specific categories of speech that are carved out. So defamation speech, that's speech, but if you say something defamatory about someone, then um, they can sue you through government courts and that's an exception. The courts can um, prosecute you, the, pro the government can, for perjury, for making a false statement in court. The government can criminalize and punish you for fraud in the sale of consumer goods, for example, or the sale of securities, false speech about a product or service. That's also permitted. False speech about simply facts in the world, however, is not a category. So that in and of itself, if I'm not trying to sell you a good, I'm just out there talking nonsense, the government can't come along in the public forums and say, well, you can't talk like that. You can't say that COVID-19 uh, is really a myth because that's false. It's demonstrably false, but I can say it. Now, I couldn't say it if I were trying to sell you um, snake oil as a treatment for something, but I could certainly do it by simply saying it. The second area of incitement, of course, is another area where hate speech, there's no such thing as a hate speech crime, so government can't, in and of itself, censor hate speech. I can say, you know, I really dislike Jews. Now, obviously, I don't, but I could say it and I could get away with it. I could say Jews are bad people. Government can't prevent that. So within those contexts, Facebook and Twitter, when they censor in those three areas, if all they're doing is censoring as a private entity, leaving aside the question whether because they have government essentially monopoly, you know, embraced monopoly power and they operate effectively like small governments, leaving that argument aside, they can censor our speech any which way they want. However, as we mentioned earlier in the, in the uh, prior podcast, if Facebook or Twitter, either acting in collusion with or for the purposes of supporting the government and the government acting in ways with Facebook and Twitter, then all of a sudden Twitter and Facebook's behavior becomes what we call state action. And they now are bound by the First Amendment restrictions, the provisions of the First Amendment as explicitly stated in the constitution and as articulated by the courts. In our particular case, well, let me, before I get to our particular case, let's just now get down to the next level, which is we all know that they're censoring, Facebook and Twitter are censoring speech. So they censored, you know, Donald Trump on basis of false speech and about the election and on incitement. And likely they even have a claim of hate speech. Certainly the left has made that argument. And what we also know is that individuals, and Tucker Carlson on Fox News has done a good job of, of reporting on this and, and raising this to the public's view. Lay people, doctors, researchers, um, and the most well-paid and most famous podcaster in the world. And what's his name? The uh, MMA guy, uh, I forgot his name, but he's an MMA, MMA announcer and he's well known. I don't happen to listen to him. He was paid a hundred million dollars to do his podcast on one of the platforms and um, has um, a tremendous number of followers. 
and I might have the dollar amount wrong. I, I kind of remember 100 million. So, um, but the fact is, is that um, he came out and simply asked the question, should a young person who's otherwise healthy or a healthy younger person, like a young adult, should they consider the risks and the benefits of a vaccine before actually taking it? And his position was apparently that if you look, if you're old and frail and have comorbidities, you should take it. But if not, you should consider the, the risk. And the risk, of course, we don't know what the medium or long-term effects are. And we're not even sure what the immediate effects are in terms of the number of deaths or the bad outcomes because the reporting is so um, uh, poor. And that's something that Tucker Carlson also spoke about. This podcaster, uh, I remember his name now, Rogan. I think his name is Seth Rogan or something, but it's Rogan. He was actually censored by Facebook or Twitter or one of the platforms for simply making that statement. So bringing it down one level further. So what is Facebook and Twitter? What are they doing? Well, they're not simply censoring false facts. They're not censoring incitement or hate speech because those categories don't fit Mr. Rogan's criticism or our criticism. Remember, we were censored. One of our podcasts was taken off of Facebook because we had said exactly the same thing. Now, we don't have the following and the social media um, oomph that this Mr. Rogan has, but it's still disconcerting to us, of course, not unexpected because we know Facebook. So what they're really doing is they're now censoring if you criticize government policy. So if the government comes out and says, you know, this is a health concern, this is our policy, you're no longer allowed to criticize that speech on the social media platforms or that policy position. Again, if it were simply Facebook or Twitter and putting aside the monopoly argument that they act like a government, the fact is, is that we now know, based upon an article that appeared in Reuters and covered a, across many media outlets, that Twitter and Facebook communicated with the Biden administration with regard to censoring speech that runs counter to the government policy on vaccinations not false facts, which you should be able to still declare. But let's, we're not even talking about simply false facts. We're talking about, simp about questioning or even contradicting public policy. Public policy, again, is taking facts and the government bureaucrats measuring the risk and the benefit calculus and coming up with a policy they believe best fits that risk benefit analysis. Now, if you simply question unintended consequences, apparently you're going to get censored, especially if you have a big enough platform. We don't have a very big platform here. It's growing, but it's still tiny. Yet we were censored. There is an individual, a doctor, and this doctor simply cited to on her Twitter account an article about a criticism of vaccines. She didn't promote it. She simply was citing to it as a reference to questioning the vaccine policies and the effectiveness as a doctor would do, as any researcher would do. And Twitter permanently banned and closed her account or whatever they do when they ban it. They didn't actually close it apparently, but she can't do any tweeting or whatever, you know, the processes are. That decision to ban her came immediately after this meeting and conversation, or in fact, several with the Biden administration and Twitter. So there's no question that we have a factual basis to make the argument 
the Twitter and Facebook and the other social media giants, but especially Twitter, met with the Biden administration, had a meeting of the minds about what they were going to censor for the government to promote the government's policy. Again, if Twitter had simply done it on its own, that'd be one thing, but they did it with the Biden administration. Now, the lawsuit's going to have various facets. So we have our client who's going to sue Twitter, its CEO, that funky guy, and President Biden and unknown administrative administration officials. And we're going to sue for what's called in our world equitable relief, which is one, a declaration by a federal court that this action violates the First Amendment because it involves Twitter conspiring and acting as a state actor with the federal government to censor speech. And we're going to sue the Biden administration for having essentially pulled Twitter's strings to do so, and the officials who actually communicated that. Now, when we sue these individuals for that equitable relief in the government, especially, um, we will be suing them in their official capacity. So you're not suing them at a personal level. You're not suing them for money damage. You're suing for equitable relief as an official. We're also going to sue for an injunction that will demand that Twitter and the administration stop this unconstitutional behavior. We're also going to include what's called a Bivens Act claim. Um, it's not a claim, but it's a way to seek damages. And there'll be nominal damages in this case because our client hasn't suffered actual damages. And we're going to sue the administrative administration officials and the individuals in Twitter for nominal damage. Now, the reason that's important is because something that we found happens when we sued the government and we, Rob and I have sued um, many state governments um, during the COVID crisis, when they were issuing these draconian orders um, that prevented free speech, that forced people to wear masks when it wasn't proven effective, when they were closing down churches and synagogues, um, preventing free speech demonstrations against the COVID protocols, even though they were allowing Black Lives Matter and even participating in it. And what did we find? When you sue, the government would either change the policy and then argue, well, that policy that you sued under is no longer into effect. We've changed it. Now you need to sue again. Your case is now moot. It's, it has no bearing today. So sue again. And so you'd have to dismiss and sue again. Or they say, well, we're going to allow your client to protest. Now, this actually happened in New York. We sued Governor Cuomo and Mayor de Blasio, the mayor of New York City, for their orders preventing public demonstrations over a certain number. At the same time, they were allowing and even participating in and encouraging the Black Lives Matter protests with thousands of people, organized and unorganized, no mask, no social distancing. So when we sued, they literally walked into court, their lawyers did, and said, okay, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but we have a way to moot your case. We're gonna let your client, Pamela Geller, she can protest all she wants with her fellow protesters, just like the Black Lives Matter. No one else can. Black Lives Matter and Ms. Geller. Now, Mr. Ushami and Mr. Muse, if you find some other plaintiff, we'll probably allow that plaintiff to, to protest too. We'll just do it one off every time. Now, of course, that makes no sense and it should violate the constitution, but the courts haven't been so clear headed about that. So what we're adding to our Arizona lawsuit is a claim, a class action claim. And this is, we're going to be suing on behalf of our client and everyone else similarly situated. So that if the government wants to try to moot the case, they're gonna to have to do it across the board and effectively change the policy. They're not gonna be able to get away with mooting the case by simply saying, we're gonna make an exception for your client. So 
that's about to launch. We're getting very close at this point. And Rob, I, if I were to anticipate probably sometime next week. Very good. A couple of, a uh, couple of points I'd like to add to, to what you discussed. You, a, a refinement in, in this respect, you referred to political speech. I often like to refer to it because the political speech can connote, you know, elections and that sort of thing, but it's really, it's public issue speech or matters on, of, of public concern, which that's, as the Supreme Court has said, that type of speech rests on the highest rung of the hierarchy of First Amendment values. That's almost a direct quote from a uh, Supreme Court case. And certainly when you're discussing COVID-19, that's certainly a matter of, of public concern. It's certainly a public issue. Um, and, and you know, so many of these other issues that people get censored on, those, you know, whether it be talking about the Second Amendment or talking about, you know, the uh, systemic racism or those other examples that I use at the, uh, at the top of this podcast, that's all public issue speech. It's matters of public concern. It gets the highest protection under the, uh, under the Supreme Court. You know, you're talking about this, you know, this joint action, right? Because Facebook and Twitter, they're private entities, but you, you can have state action when you have a private entity that is working jointly with the government or conspiring with the government. You know, when you say conspiracy these days, right, that's, that connotes this notion that there's some sort of, you know, uh, you know, crazy theory. And, but conspiracy is a legitimate claim under criminal law and civil law. So if you have an agreement, a conspiracy as a matter of law requires an agreement, a meeting of the minds, as, as uh, David had mentioned. So if you have an agreement between the government, the federal government, the Biden administration, in one of these social media platforms to censor speech, and then you have an overt act in furtherance of that agreement, that by definition is a conspiracy. And so you know we have, we have facts, certainly allegations, that there was a meeting of the minds between uh, social media, in this case, Twitter, the Biden administration, the government, and there was an overt act in furtherance of that agreement. That is a conspiracy. You know, there's a famous case out of the Supreme Court where you had a judge who, a judge who has absolute immunity. You can't sue a judge for anything he does in the, in court or related to, you know, the judicial proceedings. You had a judge who conspired with private attorneys to, you know, cause harm to the, to the, uh, you know, to a, a party in the particular case. And there was an allegation that this was a conspiracy. And it went all the way up to the Supreme Court because the question was, how can you, you know, you can conspire with a government official to make state action. But here you had a government official who had absolute immunity. The Supreme Court said, no, that doesn't matter. The fact that he's a, a government official acting under the color of, of, of law as a government official and you're conspiring with them, you can bring a civil action for a violation of, uh, of constitutional rights. We had used an example in a prior podcast Right, an FBI agent believes you have criminal there's criminal contraband in somebody's house. He doesn't want to have to go through the process of getting a warrant, going through a neutral magistrate as required by the Fourth Amendment. So he, you know, tells your neighbor to, hey, come over here. You know, I'll give you ten bucks. You go in, go, you know, go through into the, the this guy's bedroom and you know, grab me his computer, his laptop, whatever, and bring it out. Right. So that individual has conspired with the state action, that, that activity is prohibited by the Fourth Amendment, even if it was a private entity, a private actor who went in because he was conspiring, acting jointly with a, uh, a federal agent. You know, there's one other component of this on state action, which I think is interesting, because there's a, there's a body of case law that make the point that when you have a, a statute, a law, right, a, a passed by the government that changes the legal relationship of the parties, you can have state action. And you know, I'm sure our listeners have heard uh, about Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, right? And this is the law that protects, um, you know, Facebook, social media, uh, and in some respects, it also protects you know anybody who has a blog. There's a there's a sword component to it, and then there's a shield component to it. I have no objections to the shield component to it, but the sword component to it is problematic. And that's what, that's what Facebook and Twitter and all these other social media um, companies rely on is Section 230 so that they're not you know, running, so they can have immunity from you know, s other state laws that might prohibit, such as certain states that uh, apply their public accommodation laws to the internet. And you know, you're denying internet services um, in, in a discriminatory way towards certain people. But this gives, them, this gives them protection. And part of this lawsuit is we're gonna challenge the constitutionality of Section 230, particularly in, in light of how it's being used as a sword. Now, how it's using the shield is that under Section 230, and they call this really the, the Good Samaritan 
blocking and screening of offensive material. That's the title of the provision. So it's treatment of a publisher or a speaker. It says no provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be treated as the publisher or speaker of any information provided by another information content provider. Now, to put that in plain speak, if you have a blog, for example, and you're operating and you're running the blog and you allow people to comment, if somebody comes in comments on my blog and that comment contains defamatory information uh, or you know, defames somebody else, me as the person who's operating the blog or if somebody posts on AFLC's Facebook page, this provides protection for me from a claim of defamation by the person who was defamed by that you know, third party's comment. Now, the, the person who defamed them by commenting on my Facebook page can still be sued. But my Facebook, or if I, you know, I have a company, right, the deep pockets, you run a Facebook page for your company or some social media for a company, and somebody comes and posts something defamatory, the, uh, the person who's defamed can't come then after your deep pockets because this provides the shield component. Now, where the problem comes in is this second part, which I, you know, I, again, I describe it as the sword part, uh, component. And it says, no provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be held liable on account of, A, any action voluntarily taken in good faith to restrict access to availability of material that the provider or user, user considers to be obscene, lewd, lascivious, filthy, excessively violent, harassing, or otherwise objectionable, whether or not such material, material is constitutionally protected. Okay, obscenity is probably the one one, uh, one category in here that the First Amendment recognizes as having that the, the government has ability to, to limit, restrict it in some ways. Um, and, and so it's one of the categories that doesn't get the full protection. But these other, you know, otherwise objectionable, this, this is what gives Facebook, the corporation, the ability to come on our Facebook page, right? This is our own Facebook page or our own uh, Twitter account and, and to, you know, basically put us in Facebook or Twitter jail because of something that we said that might be objectionable to the censors, right? And what does it mean to have good faith? This thing is so vague and grants them such power to control messages. I mean, think about how, how dangerous this is. And this is the power that's being given to them by the government. So I would argue, based on, a, you know, the body of case law I mentioned before, that this itself is also creating a, a measure of state action where they're giving where the, the federal government is changing the legal relationship between the parties, between us and, and Facebook, as it were, based by giving them the ability to censor our speech that is otherwise fully protected by the Constitution. And, and think about the impact. These, you know, David had mentioned about how these companies have become so big, right? President Trump had, I forget what the number was, you know, 40, 50 million followers, right? And, and certainly politicians use these social media to campaign, to get their message out. And if you have these, you know, leftist progressives and, you know, that are operating and, and running the boards for these companies, shutting down, you know, during, you know, a general election, the Twitter or Facebook count of, of one of the primary candidates, my God, they are shaping the elections in, in a very, very, you know, in, in a very material way. And think about how dangerous that is to be able to, to, be able to do that. Well, Rob, you don't even have to think about it, if I can just interject. <laughs> Look at what happens every single day. The, the other side can say that white men and women, but especially white men, are inherently racist, privileged, um, that we live in a hateful, we've built a hateful society, a hateful civilization, a racist one. They can make claims of systemic racism without any evidence whatsoever or even any real discussion, they can make their statements. But the statements on the other side of the political spectrum are censored, critiqued, punished constantly. Yeah, and that, uh, that is known as viewpoint discrimination, which is, as the courts have said, the most egregious form of content discrimination known under the, uh, under the First Amendment. So something has to change radically here with the, you know, with the, the social media. And, you know, there's been some efforts with, 
you know, creating alternatives such as Parler and Gab and, you know, some of these other social media platforms, which we're trying to break, you know, break out of Facebook and Twitter ourselves. I mean, we shut down our Twitter account, but uh, Facebook, we, you know, we're, we're still operating on, we have 17,000 followers and we're trying to, you know, transition those people over to Gab and some of these other, or like Rumble, for example, we post our video casts on Rumble because they don't censor like YouTube does. Um, so we're we're trying to get off of these uh, left wing social media platforms, and and as these newer, more conservative, or should I say, more open to free speech platforms, because certainly even if you're not conservative, you still can set up a you know a, a channel on Rumble and and some of these other places as well. So this is a you know we're, this should be uh, and, and will be a very important uh, lawsuit. And and again, I I know David was kind of uh, dancing around some of the facts because until we get this filed, we don't. You know, obviously, uh, we don't want to divulge any particular or specific legal strategy. And uh, but uh, we will once it gets filed, it'll be another uh, topic of uh, of our uh, video cast podcast um, for sure. So, you know, what's but, interesting, let me just jump in. If you want to know the power of social media, um, it is the communication, the Federal Communication Act, the Section 230 that we talked that Rob just went through very well, because keep in mind that in the old media world, if a newspaper or a magazine or any publisher, me, if I publish a, you know, a little screed that I want to, you know, print out in my mimeograph or go to FedEx and have them bind, you know, a, my own newspaper, those little weeklies or dailies you'd find on the sidewalk for free that sell advertisement. If they publish something from someone else, a comment, a letter that was defamatory, they could be held liable for defamation like the author could. And that was standard law. They were responsible for what they published, not just the author who sought their platform to publish. The social media giants who'd created this new reality where comments, and that's where it all started. You know, you, you, you had, before there were social media giants, before Facebook, if you had your, if you opened your own little website and you published blogs, you had the option on almost all of them to allow the public to comment. Now, as the owner of that blog, you could edit those comments. You could keep them private until you edit and approve them, and then you could post them or you could just leave it open and let people post whatever they wanted, or you could have no comments whatsoever. You controlled that aspect. When they started developing the social media further, the, the, you know, the monetizing aspect of it was to get as many eyeballs as possible. And so you wanted people to be able to feel like they could just go on and comment whatever they wanted. And of course, when you allow people to comment anonymously, you get a lot of trash, you get garbage, you get defamation, you get fraud, you get incitement, you get all the, the, the things that you don't want along with things that you do want. So the big social media giants were worried we're going to get sued. So they pressured Congress to pass this provision. They said, look, as long as we're not editing the work, we're not contributing to the text and we allow people to just post whatever they want. So if you buy a face, if you get our Facebook um, service, then you can put on your Facebook page, whatever you want. As long as there's no censorship at that level and you're allowed to kind of post, then the, the social media platforms and the people who have the blogs, they should be immune from lawsuit. Otherwise, why should they? The old media weren't. Their argument was you kill the industry. In other words, the social media giants were able to must, muster the muscle in Congress to get a law passed so that this new industry could somehow be exempt from the common law of defamation and tortious interference, all the other civil torts and criminal laws that are out there. They wanted a cocoon of immunity and they were able to get it. When they thought through that provision, they realized, wait, if, we, if, the, if the qualifying aspect of the immunity is 
that we're not editing and we're not, you know, doing the censorship up front. And it's a wild and woolly kind of wild, wild west situation with comments. Then you're going to get a lot of garbage up there that we don't want. It's going to hurt our brand. And that was where the shield comes in, where Congress said, okay, generally speaking, you have to be a social media platform or a blog that lets people just comment freely. But you're allowed to censor against these obscenity, et cetera. But they didn't keep it narrow. They didn't say obscenity. They didn't say consumer fraud. They didn't say um, criminal incitement. They didn't say specific categories. What they did was they had so much power in Congress said, and let's just say otherwise objectionable. And you know as well as we know that the phrase otherwise objectionable, <laughs> which is not a legal term of art, means whatever you think it means. So it means to Facebook, whatever it means from day to day, and it can change. And of course, because Trump and those people who voted for Trump and who would vote for Trump again are just inherently otherwise objectionable to Facebook and Twitter. They don't need a lot of rationale to, to cut you off at the knees, figuratively speaking, on their platforms. Yeah, and you know, with the, uh, the podcast that we had censored by Facebook, we were talking about the evidence linking the uh, COVID-19 to the lab in Wuhan and the evidence suggesting that it was likely a, a bio warfare weapon. Well, apparently that didn't fit, you know, what their narrative, narrative was and they considered it objectionable. And, and so uh, that was censored from Facebook. So it, it, it's very dangerous for them to have this power and we're, you know, we're going to try to do something about it. Um, so let's, I want to change gears here because in the, the time that we have remaining, I've got a, uh, I've got an argument next uh, Wednesday, May 12th, before the U.S. Court of Appeals for the uh, Eighth Circuit and uh, a case arising out of uh, Minnesota. And I just want to take a minute to talk about that. And, and in our podcast next Thursday, hopefully I'll be able to give you a postmortem, as it were, um, following the oral argument. Um, this is a case, quite frankly, it's, it's a case we should win on appeal. Um, we drew one of the worst judges we could have drawn in the district court, my local counsel, uh, right after we filed and it was assigned to the, uh, the judge that was assigned to. He said, well, um, expect an adverse ruling and we'll be up in the Eighth Circuit. And the Eighth Circuit is considered one of the more conservative circuits. We apparently drew a pretty good panel. Um, but as they say, the proof of the pudding's in the eating. So I'll wait and see what the hell come, how the outcome, the ultimate outcome of this case. So here's the, 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 the gist of this, uh, this lawsuit. In 2019, um, Sally Ness, who's our plaintiff at the time, a 57 year old grandmother. I'm not sure if she's 58 or 59 right now, but she, she, and she lived in a neighborhood and, uh, in Minnesota, and this is in Hennepin County, by the way. And, and if, if Hennepin County doesn't ring a bell with you, Hennepin County is where the George Floyd incident took place. Right. And, and just think about how important it was, uh, for the County and the prosecutors to have that videotape that was taken by somebody with either an iPhone or something uh, along those lines, uh, you know, somebody who, who videotaped the incident between the police officer and, uh, and George Floyd, because this is a case about videotaping. So Sally Ness, and she lives in the uh, city of Bloomington, uh, Minnesota, again, it's in Hennepin County. Uh, they were in her residential neighborhood. A, there was a mosque built, the Dal Al Farouk Mosque, and they had a, a charter school, Success Academy, charter schools under Minnesota law are public schools in the neighborhood. And this, this mosque and the school were consistently violating the zoning regulations and, and causing disruption in the neighborhood with traffic, traffic issues. And um, one of the things that the city did is they actually loaned them, leased them, the city park that our, plain, our clients uh, would go oftentimes with their grandchildren. They couldn't use it because it was, it was overwhelmed with all the students and everybody else. Um, even though the city council, uh, the, the city recommended that they put in their own um, playground equipment, but the city nonetheless improved the use of the, uh, uh, the lease of the park to them. Um, so basically they took over this residential neighborhood and the, the residents kept making complaints to city council. Uh, city council wouldn't do anything about these complaints with the excess of noise, traffic, you name it. Um, and so she decided to start filming, filming these, uh, these violations from on the public street or, or public park, everything she filmed was in, in public view. 
and she would present it to the city. And when they continued to just disregard her complaints, she created a Facebook page and a blog, and she would post up all these violations of the, of the city's ordinances and zoning regulations and everything else. Um, and what did she get for that? She had police officers show up at her house and tell her that she needed to stop her filming or she would be uh, arrested for violating Minnesota's harassment statute. A provision of the statute that says you can't monitor by technology. That's what it provides. So here we are in, again in Hennepin County, you have a private citizen who's filming in, from a public forum and public view, matters that are occurring in public view regarding a public controversy. And she was posting them up on the internet. And for that, she gets threatened with prosecution by, the, uh, by city police officers. And it wasn't just that. A month or so later, she's visited at her house by two detectives and, and another, uh, it's like a community officer, whatever they uh, name this person had, at her house and is interviewed by, uh, by, these, in, by these two detectives. And they tell her that, she's, uh, that you know, they're investigating a violation of the harassment statute, the Minnesota harassment statute. And they, in fact, forward the investigation off to the Hennepin County prosecutor for prosecution as a felony because the subjects of her filming at time were minors. And so it's a felony under this harassment statute if it involves a minor. But that's not all they did. The city also passed an ordinance in October of that year. I believe the meeting with the, uh, so they, she, was, she had the police arrive at her house in, in August of uh, 2019. I believe she had this meeting with these two detectives and this uh, community liaison officer uh, sometime in, in September. And then sometime in October, the city passed a city ordinance that says no person shall intentionally take a photograph or otherwise record a child without the consent of the child's parent or guardian in any city park. No doubt this, this ordinance was aimed right at our, at our client. So enough was enough. So we we sued the, uh, the city challenging the, uh, the harassment statute facially and as applied to our clients uh, filming as well as this, uh, this city ordinance. And you know the district court granted their motion dismissed, denied our motion for summary judgment. Uh, she was totally wrong. I, I fully expect to have a reversal and hoping to have a reversal up in the, uh, the eighth circuit. Starting with that city ordinance, right? You, any content-based restriction on speech in a traditional public forum, which a city park is, much satisfies strict scrutiny, the highest level of scrutiny, right? That means the government has to have a compelling interest to restrict this speech. And the restriction must be narrowly tailored to, to advance that interest. And the city, even in their, in their filing said, well, she can't film when she's in a public park, but if she could take one step out of the park, she could do exactly the same filming that was, that was unconstitutional I mean, excuse me, that was unlawful when she was one foot in. Well, that's, that's absurd. That just shows that they, that they don't have a compelling interest. It's so under-inclusive. And it, it's a content-based restriction because in order to find out if somebody violated it, you have to look at the content of the filming. If she's filming trees and squirrels, it's fine. But if there's a, you know, a child in the video, it's unlawful. Um, you know, the, the court below said it was a content-neutral time, place, manner restriction. It's just wrong as a matter of law. Right. If you have to, if the regulators have to look at the content of the speech to determine whether you violate the law, it's content based. So I fully expect to prevail on that. One other component of this, which is very interesting, which we got to the harassment statute, the uh, you know can't monitor by technology. The attorney general for uh, Minnesota intervened in the case. That's Keith Ellison, right? Our, our left wing progressive uh, Muslim uh, who used to be in, in Congress. He intervened. And, uh, and, and he took the position that this, uh, that this statute prohibits harassing videotaping. We had an amicus brief filed, a very good one, filed on our behalf by multiple news organizations. Are you kidding me? I mean, look at, I mean, you're going you're gonna to criminalize somebody who videotapes peacefully, passively videotaping matters of public concern and plain public view about a public controversy, and they could be you know, charged under this, this uh, ordinance, the city ordinance, or prosecuted potentially as a felony. Um, and if the uh, individual, uh, you know, is filming, a, uh, is filming a child. So it's just, this thing is a, an egregious violation of the, uh, of the First Amendment. I'll be arguing this case um, again next Wednesday. And it's interesting, I'm gonna be doing it via, via video like this before a three judge panel of the US Court of Appeals for the Eighth Circuit. 
I, I fully hope that, uh, you know, in, in anticipate that we're going to ultimately prevail. Because if we don't think about the, uh, the consequences of this, and, and again, when you, when you put it in context that this occurred in Hennepin County, right, where, where they're, they're saying that you don't have a First Amendment right to, to videotape matters of, of, of a public concern. And, and why was it harassing? Just because, you know, the, the people associated with the mosque didn't like the fact that she was calling them out on all of their, you know, violations of the law and posting it up publicly. This was all in public view. It wasn't like she was, you know, secreting or hiding your camera. I mean, she's out there in public view on the public sidewalk videotaping that you could see with the, uh, you know, with the naked eye, but she was capturing it on video so she could complain to the city and she could make a record for it. And for that, uh, she was threatened with, uh, with prosecution. And interestingly, the, uh, the Hennepin County prosecutor, after we filed the lawsuit, we sued them as well because they are the officials responsible for enforcing the statute. After we filed the lawsuit, after we served them with the lawsuit, and, uh, and even before they notified the city, they said, oh, well, we're not going to prosecute her for her past conduct, right? They left open any, any, potential, uh, any potential future conduct. And even then, the city said, well, if the, if the county doesn't prosecute her for a felony, we can still prosecute her for a, uh, for a misdemeanor offense. And certainly all of this, you can imagine. I mean, if you were in her shoes, the chilling effect that this has, uh, has on her speech. And so we're, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll ultimately prevail and we'll be arguing, I'll be arguing that case next Wednesday before the uh, Eighth Circuit. We typically do these video cast podcasts on Thursdays. So hopefully I can give you again, a, a rundown of uh, how I thought the argument went. Um, you can't always judge by the questioning, but sometimes it gives a, sometimes it's a good hint as to the direction the court might be, uh, uh, might be going on this case. So that's a uh, quick summation of a, of a case that we've been uh, litigating since 2019 and uh, going to be doing oral argument in the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Eighth Circuit next Wednesday. Rob, you know, one of the, uh, first of all, what I'd like to be able to do is um, give our listeners um, a, a link because oftentimes at the appellate level, they either do video or they more likely do audio recordings of the oral argument. So we can maybe provide that as, you know. Yeah. And I, quite frankly, I don't know what the Eighth Circuit does, though. They, you can't, you can't uh, join live and watch the video the day of. They don't allow that. Um, they indicated, and it won't be up until next week, that there's a phone number that they're going to post up on their website. I don't have it yet because it hasn't been posted um, that you can you can call in and just listen to the argument. And I don't, I don't know. I know the sixth circuit um, will put them up afterwards and other circuits. I don't know what the eighth circuit um, will do, but if they do have a, uh, if they do have a link, uh, we will we'll likely post it up on, on Facebook. And we also have a case page for each of our cases. And if there's a way to, uh, that I can get the link, um, that's one of the places they can go look is on our website, AmericanFreedomLawCenter.org go on to cases and look up NESS, N-E-S-S, and uh, it'll be posted there if in fact they, they do have provide a link. And as a shortened version, you can go to AFLC.us uh, and also get to our Facebook page. You know, yeah. just a, a short comment on this case. Uh, one of the things that Rob and I have been involved with over the past decade, um, maybe even decade and a half, has been claims by churches and synagogues when um, they run afoul of zoning laws and suing on their behalf local officials because they don't want a synagogue in their neighborhood or they don't want a church in their neighborhood or they don't want an expansion in their neighborhood. And I guarantee you that those battles are hot and heavy and they're not easy. And the government and the villages and the little cities they fight you tooth and nail. I've personally in, been involved with Jewish day schools where we've had that battle. The difference though comes when it's a Muslim mosque or Muslim school. Invariably, the um, disruption to parking or what have you that are brought by individuals in the community is met with hostility by the villages and the cities. They, they literally run roughshod over their own zoning laws to grant approval to the Muslim mosque and the day schools. We've even had a case where um, the Council on American Islamic Relations, the Muslim Brotherhood front group that operates as the so-called 
Muslim American Civil Rights uh, 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 Organization has issued unlawful, unconstitutional subpoenas trying to frighten citizens who simply showed up at public hearings to voice their opposition to an expansion or a new mosque or what have you. So um, the disparity in treatment between a Jewish or a Christian institution versus the Muslim institutions is you know, manifest. You just see it day in and day out in this country. Yeah, and, and if you, you know, and certainly our client, you know, she's been called Islamophobe and everything, right? All those, all the, and it's, it's a grandmother who, who wants to have her neighborhood back and wants to have her, her, her park or her, her local, you know, neighborhood park back. Doesn't matter who, but because it, it's, it's the, uh, you know, it's a Muslim organization, it's, you know, you get labeled with all the names and you don't see the same thing if somebody's, you know, opposing a synagogue or, or, a, uh, or a church or something in the zoning, they don't get, you know, labeled anti-Semite and anti-Christian or, you know, uh, Christophobe, if there's such a term, you know, but certainly you see that with the, um, with the, with the, the Muslim uh, and, when you're when you're doing something like in way, this you, case, this woman who's who's trying who's you know pointing out legitimate concerns and violations. In fact, it, many other people in the neighborhood um, also you know were joining in this. But she was the point person, and she was videotaping to make a record of it. And what does she get? She gets police officers showing up at her door. And staying um, on the same thing before we go to another um, final kind of word here. If you pivot to the university level, you will have course after course degrees in biblical criticism, in attacks by the sociology department, by the religious departments, by any number of departments of the Christian Bible, of the Jewish Torah, of the religion um, as being, you know, man-made, false, everything else. Try finding a course critical of Islam and the Quran as false historically, as Muhammad as um, possibly not, e not even a real historical figure or as a pedophile or as any of the other criticisms of, of Muhammad. Try finding a university course that has the same kind of criticism against Islam, Muhammad, the Quran, as you find against Judaism and Christianity and their holy works and so forth. It doesn't exist. And if it does, I don't know about it. All right, let's, you know, I want to uh, do another transition here. Last, uh, last week, we discussed systemic racism. And, uh, and I know there's, uh, there's an article or, or that kind of makes a point that I know you wanted to, uh, you wanted to address, David. So I'll, I'll turn the mic back over to you. Right. So we talked about systemic racism and, and um, how the left treats it. That is to say, they simply assume that every time um, a person of color, black person or Latino is shot by a police officer, it must be racism when in fact there's no real evidence. There certainly wasn't in the George Floyd case and there's been no evidence that we can find across the board of that. Now there are ca individual cases where I'm sure an individual police officer might have been a bigot or a racist and that motivated him or her. But these cases that have come to fore of late have not evidenced that. And in fact, as we pointed out last week, Keith Ellison, the African-American Muslim um, attorney general of the state, when he led the prosecution, said that when asked, why didn't you include a hate crime against the police officer who killed George Floyd? And he said there was simply no evidence of it. So we found an article in the Voice of America News. Now, the Voice of America News, even though it's the Voice of America and is supposed to be promoting this country around the world, um, or at least presenting the news of this country objectively, had an article that came out. And you can find it um, by just Googling Voice of American News, anti-Asian hate crime crosses racial and ethnic lines. So the article is about the recent increase this past year of hate crimes, especially in New York and, and other big cities. And they looked specifically at New York. And the thought was that 
you know, of course, these Asians are being attacked on the street and, and, uh, and you know, being shot at by that lunatic who shot up uh, Asian massage parlors, all because white men um, are racist. Well, it turns out that the individual who shot up the Asian massage parlors has said quite clearly it had nothing to do with Asian. It had something to do with um, his angst against um, the massage parlor industry and whatever it was, but it hasn't been, and there's no evidence that it was directed toward Asians, as tragic as that incident was. But in terms of the attacks against Asians as Asians, in New York City, for example, in the Voice of America um, article, it points out that the number of attacks were predominantly carried out by African Americans and Latinos, the overwhelming majority. And the same has been true in other major cities. So the specific fact is proportionally, the city of New York has 50, uh, so let me, so what was the explanation? So the explanation is not that the longstanding discussion that there is a problem between the Asian American communities and the black communities in the large cities. Um, and that's been discussed time and time again in the literature. The response was that the reason why these big cities and especially New York have more attacks by blacks and by Latinos against Asians and not whites is that, well, there's more blacks and Latinos in the big city of New York and other major cities than white people. And so we would expect to have far more attacks. Unfortunately, the numbers don't add up. Demographically, the percentages still show that the vast majority of attacks against Asians by Blacks and Latinos um, far exceeds their demographics in a particular city or across the country. So what was offered in this Voice of America news article was the following. So I'm just going to read it now to you. In response to the surge in anti-Asian hate incidents, the New York Police Department created a task force last year. Asked about the anti-Asian hate crime perpetrators' backgrounds, Deputy Inspector Stuart Wu, the task force head, said he could not confirm the statistics, but they are often misleading. I can only quote, I can only give the facts that I know, which is this task force was created by Asian and black ranking officers within the NYPD, the New York Police Department, Lou said in an email. Leaders of the black community were the first and most vocal in publicity condemning the surge in hate crimes against Asians. Now here really comes the, the kicker. Jack McDevitt, a, social, a sociology professor at Northeastern University, a good school, and co-author of two books on hate crimes, cautions against reading too much into the data. What was the data? That Blacks and Latinos were attacking Asians far more than whites and far more than their demographics would suggest they should be. Quote, when you look at the data nationally in any given community in any given year, you can have an anonymous, anomalous, meaning an off wire, number of hate crimes reported to the police because so many are not reported, he said. In other words, he's implying that the hate crimes against Asians committed by whites are just not getting reported for some reason. But when a black person does it or a Latino, it does get reported. And gee, that's just not fair. And then he continues, nevertheless, Noting that most hate crime perpetrators tend to be white, McDevitt added that, quote, other communities have modeled their attacks on what we white folks have been doing for a long time now, end quote. In other words, even though it's African Americans attacking Asians in numbers far exceeding what their demographics would suggest and Latinos, why are they doing it? not because they're racist or bigoted, because we white people are bigoted and racist and we've taught them how to be bigoted and racist. And if it weren't for us, they wouldn't be bigoted and racist. 
I mean, that's the absurdity. And it's because they deny human nature. Unfortunately and tragically, there's always going to be bigotry. There's always going to be discrimination between those that we consider our own and others. It's not right. We should avoid it. It's not right in some circumstances, but it is right in others. And we talked about that. I can legitimately discriminate against my neighbor's children versus my children when I come home and pay for their food and their housing and deny that to my neighbor. I don't have to reach into my pocket. If I do, because I'm charitable, that's one thing. But no one expects me to support my neighbor's kids or the kids across the city or kids across the country in the same way that I support my own. I discriminate in favor of mine versus the other. The same is true when any country puts up a border or a boundary. We are discriminating in favor of our citizens versus the other. It takes place all the time. There's legitimate discrimination based upon the distinction between us and the other, and there's illegitimate. We would never say that if you're living lawfully in this country, that you should be discriminated against because you're of a different skin color or different race or nationality. In America, we talk about equal opportunity. We employ equal opportunity. We have laws for it. We prosecute to make sure that people adhere to equal opportunity. And are there bad actors and bad circumstances? All the time. And that's why they get sued or prosecuted. But in and of itself, the idea that the left will never take ownership of this aspect of human nature, nor will they say that any other country, any other society is racist systemically other than America and other Western civilizations. Yeah, this, uh, like I said, the, the George Floyd example just, you know, sort of blew up that narrative, which was a narrative that was used to literally burn down cities all summer long. The systemic racism we find at the end of the day after a criminal trial um, and those who are leading it. And, you know, Ellison is certainly one of these ones that, that you know, trumpets the uh, Black Lives Matter mantra. And they had to conclude at the end, no evidence of, no evidence of racism on part of the officer, never mind systemic racism on the part of the police department, which was the chief of police who happens to be an African-American. But we are in interesting times. I want to, uh, I got one last thing, our last piece before we, uh, we close out here. You know, so in the, in the morning- there, Rob, can, I, can I interrupt for yes. just a minute? I, want to, I don't want to be simple-minded about the George Floyd Chauvin, you know, lack of evidence of, of um, because what, what Keith Ellison and the progressives will say is what's the big deal? So Chauvin himself, himself was not a racist or bigot, or at least there was no evidence that that, if he was, that that led to his criminal behavior that led to the death of George Floyd. But the fact that he was in that neighborhood and the fact that the police have policies that allow them to respond in violent ways rather than in nonviolent ways and rather than um, some kind of interdiction that is less violent. Um, the fact that George Floyd was an addict and couldn't find assistance in society, the fact that George Floyd was pressured because of systemic racism to pass a counterfeit dollar to buy his cigarettes or whatever he was buying because he was a drag addict, all of those other things still exist as systemic racism. And just because Mr. Chauvin himself um, didn't commit the crime based upon bigotry, doesn't mean that the circumstances put him and George Floyd in that place because of systemic racism. Now that's their argument and they'll finesse it in ways, but understand one thing, none of those statements carry with them demonstrable evidence of systemic racism. The fact that this country suffers from drug addiction isn't inherently or isn't evidence of racism. The fact that there's greater levels of, of drug addiction in inner cities where blacks tend to live um, or other minorities um, 
isn't evidence of systemic racism. It might be evidence that lower social economic um, uh, uh, parts of our society are going to suffer more from these kinds of things, but it doesn't spell racism to me. It might spell, um, you know, what happens to poor people or to less educated people, even though we know that well-educated and affluent people can become addicted to drugs. When they live in those slum areas, when they live in low economic areas in inner cities, the drug dealers gravitate there, violence follows them, crime and other types of, of behavior um, center around those kind of communities and the police are there and violence occurs and bad you know, interactions between police and citizens occur. But that isn't necessarily racism. And just because blacks or other minorities are part of that demographic, they're ignoring the reality that that there are a lot of other possible explanations than, other than systemic racism. And if individuals, the vast majority of individuals in this country are not racist, like the black chief of police, like the black mayors, like the black police officers, if they themselves are not racist, how then does systemic racism occur, right? An institution or society is not a real thing, it's a fiction. So systemic, it's systemic of what thing? A thing is consist of the individuals who make up the thing. Right? Uh, and, anyway. Yeah, it's like you're the example of the systemic racism. The fact that you have a, an African-American chief of police who's in charge of it shows that the system is not inherently racist. You had somebody rise to the highest level of authority in the police department who happens to be an African-American. All those circumstances that you described, all those socioeconomic circumstances that, you know, that get get argued that that's you know evidence of systemic racism. I would argue is evidence of the failed left wing Democrat policies that have undermined and have gutted these these inner cities, which happen to be mostly populated demographically, tend to be more minorities than others. They are being not harmed by systemic racism. They are being harmed by left wing policies, Democrat policies more than anything else. And certainly we could go on and on probably for another uh, 20, 30 minutes, if not longer. So let me, uh, if I can, I'll just wrap up uh, that part of it. I was, I was saying, you know, this morning, my, uh, you know, every morning, my wife and I, would get up early, have, have coffee together. And before we go do our morning prayer, have a discussion. My wife is an absolute fan of the, uh, of Lord of the Rings and J.R.R. Tolkien, the, the author. Um, and, 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 not just, you know, not the movies. I mean, she's read the books like seven times. And there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of depth in those, in those, uh, um, in those books. They're not just, you know, children's fantasy tales. And if you really read them with, with, uh, you know, trying to get the insight that Tolkien was trying to convey, but there was, there's one section that she really enjoys. It's a, it's about a paragraph or so that I, I just want to read. And I just got a couple of comments. And this is a conversation between Frodo and Sam. And it starts, said, I don't like anything here at all, said Frodo. Step or stone, uh, breath or bone, earth, air, and water all seem accursed, but so our path is laid. Yes, that's so, said Sam. And we shouldn't be here at all if we'd known more about it before we started. But I suppose it's often that way. The brave things in the old tales and songs, Mr. Frodo, adventures, as I used to call them. I used to think that they were things that the wonderful folk of the stories went out and looked for because they wanted them, because they were exciting and life was a bit dull, a kind of a sport, as you might say. But that's not the way of it with the tales that really mattered or the ones that stay in the mind. Folks seem to have been just landed in them usually. Their paths were laid that way, as you put it. But I expect they had lots of chances like us of turning back, only they didn't. And if they had, we shouldn't know because they'd have been forgotten. Hmm. You know, we are living in difficult times. There's no doubt about it. But these are our times, right? It's our adventure. It's our time to make history, our time to move forward and not turn back. You know, there's a lot of things we complain about. Well, let's make this our adventure, our task to change those things. Let's make it our history and do something about it. 
And uh, so with that, I want to, uh, I'm going to close. And again, cause that's all the time we have. I know we've gone over an hour and, and we always look forward to our next discussion. And we thank all of you for joining us. And a, a reminder, as you know, our video casts are posted on our Rumble and YouTube channels and our podcasts. You can find them on Spotify and Stitcher. And if you like the content, please follow us and please spread the word. You know, we want to grow our audience and, and thank you again. And as always, may God bless you and may he continue to bless America. Amen.